So our second group of, of snippets for this week looks at the relationship between uh, the court, constitutional history in general, during the uh, the twenties, and what we would now call culture war issues, social uh, um, uh, debates among the public. Um, and the 20s, remember in class, we, we talked some about that Adkins case, the very conservative uh, court on economic issues during the 1920s. But the other big theme in constitutional history during the 1920s is, uh, are, are these debates about, uh, about cultural concern. And one of the backdrops to this are, is the changing pattern of immigration uh, to the United States. Um, so if you can see on the chart here, uh, the, the red pies are immigrants who come from Northern and Western Europe. The uh, blue pies are immigrants who come from Southern and Eastern uh, Europe. So Italians, East Europeans, uh, Russians, there's a significant number of Jews who are part of this immigrant pattern. They're seen as, as sort of alien and contrary to you know, traditional American ideals. And as you can see, the, uh, the pattern is fewer and fewer Northern and Western uh, European immigrants until we get to the 20s, after, which, which is when Congress will pass laws uh, restricting uh, the number of immigrants who come from outside of the Northern and Western uh, 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 Europe area. Two pieces of legislation, one passed in 1921 on a temporary basis, and a second passed in 1924, the Immigration Act, which, which establishes an outright quota uh, system, and critically uses the census of 1890 to determine uh, share. So just before we have this wave of immigration from Southern and, uh, and Eastern Europe. The, 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 the sense here is that uh, Southern and East European uh, um, immigrants were, were alien, they were anti-American, they didn't accept American ideals. And it's true that there is a kind of radical surge um, on the far left of the United States in the, uh, in the 1900s and 19 teens that includes lots of or, or disproportionate numbers of, uh, of immigrants. But this is, you know, this is xenophobia of a type that, you know, we are all uh, uh, familiar with. But this era um, it, uh, culminates in, in the courts as well in this very, very famous case in Massachusetts called the Sacco and Vanzetti case. These are Italian immigrants, anarchists, um, who are charged with murder in a, in a dubious case. I mean, there's, the, the evidence here is... <laughs> You know, it's possible that they did it, um, but the trial is just awful. The judge is conspiring with the uh, with the prosecution. It's, it, they're just massive violations of civil liberties. They are convicted. They're sentenced to death. Um, they the this becomes an international cause celebre that uh, you know. Uh, right wing says, you know, this, these, this shows the dangers of immigration, the dangers of anarchism. Um, uh, civil libertarians say this is, you know, this is just an outrage. They appeal to the governor of Massachusetts, who, who basically passes the buck, appoints a special commission, who, which comes back with a report saying, well, this wasn't the greatest of trials, but the execution should go ahead. Uh, and ultimately, in 1927, they are uh, they're executed to international condemnation. Um, but there are lots of things going on in the Sacco and Benzetti trial. The first is the death penalty, where the U.S. is already really distinguishing itself from European states, which have moved towards uh, towards abolition. The second is anti-immigrant sentiment. The sense is that these are people who are just inherently dangerous because they uh, uh, they're immigrants. Um, and the third is this tension between civil liberties and national security. And here, the, here the national security concerns are are, are the fears of anarchist uh, uh, terror. And and anarchist terror is actually a major element of world history uh, during the first two decades of the 20th century. So it's not as if this concern came out of uh, of nowhere. But this was not an anarchist, uh, you know, a, t a terrorist attack in this uh, in this respect. So the, the Sacco and Vanzetti case, in, in some respects, is seen as the trial of the century. But of course, there are there, there are many such trials during the uh, during the 1920s. The the Supreme Court doesn't distinguish itself on these issues during the decade. Um, the, there, there's what there is a cleanup case called Gitlow versus uh, New York, which is an outgrowth of a series of decisions made in New York State during the. Uh, 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 1918 and 1919, and the uh, uh, during and after World War uh, uh, World War One. Um, in the 1918 elections, there are five socialist uh, uh, candidates elected to the New York Assembly. All are anti-war. Um, you know, again, they accept the socialist interpretation of World War One is that this is a a capitalist conflict, and and so uh, the proletariat should be uh, should be opposed. Uh, they go to Albany, um, and you know, I. 
I, you know, I don't want to shock here, and but you know, because I know that when all of us think of of, of an ethically pristine uh, institution, the New York State Legislature is what immediately comes to mind. I mean, they're just they're they're just a, a tower of integrity, but in this just one time, they 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 weren't able to do it. Uh, and in in 1919, they kick out these five duly elected socialists because they have. Uh, just because they're socialists and they're they're anti-war, it's it's an outrageous uh, uh, act, um, and this is part of a broader pattern of using New York State power against uh, uh, anti-war socialists, which eventually works its way up to the Supreme Court in a case called Gitlow versus New York. This was um, due, uh, this was an outgrowth of a criminal prosecution of a of a socialist named Benjamin Gitlow by New York State uh, authorities, and it tested the limitations of Justice Holmes's uh, decision in. In, uh, in Schenck versus the United States. And this case in 1925 gives just extraordinary power. It's a seven to two decision, Holmes and Brandeis are the two dissenters, gives extraordinary power to state governments that want to basically suppress speech that is you know, critical of state policies. Uh, take a look at what I have bolded here in the red, that it's okay for the state uh, to um, uh, uh, use its police power to punish those who abuse the freedom of the press by utterances inimical to the public welfare, tending to corrupt public morals, incite to crime, or disturb the public peace. I mean, any critical uh, speech uh, of, of government could fit those definitions. Um, this, this case is no longer good law, but it's a reminder of how the, con the, the, the conservative Supreme Court really wants to get on the side of, uh, of conservatives in, in the culture war. Similarly, in Congress, the major initiative of, uh, of the NAACP during the 1920s is this law called the Dyer Anti-Lynching Act. Remember last week in the snippets, I, I showed the, the chart of, uh, of all of the lynches in the U.S. in the 1890s, 1900s, and 19-teens. NAACP form is, is formed in 1909. They recognize that the state and local uh, state governments, local sheriffs are not going to uh, prosecute lynching in the South. So their goal is the creation of a federal uh, uh, law. This passes the uh, the House, so it would make it a fed. It would make lynching a federal crime. In the Senate, however, it is filibustered. Uh, the Senate has a tradition that debate can be closed in the Senate only with a certain vote. At this point in U.S. history, it's two thirds of the Senate have to vote to uh, to close the debate. Debate. Then you can move on to a vote on the measure. Um, uh, all of the Southern senators uh, uh, vote against uh, ending. The, the filibuster. Some northern conservatives do as well, and the Anti-Lynching uh, uh, Act, which is proposed in every Congress during the 1920s and into the 1930s, is never enacted into uh, into law. This this those of you who follow uh, contemporary politics, um, uh, the proposal for an anti-lynching uh, law was revived in the current uh, uh, Congress. And then there are the state laws uh, uh, against uh, civil liberties, those famous of which leads to the next trial of the century, just after Sacco and Vanzetti. This is the Tennessee law, which bans the teaching of evolution in public uh, schools. And this, uh, uh, so it's, it's, it's designed to target biology teachers. There's a biology teacher named Charles Scopes, who in Tennessee teaches evolutionary biology. He's prosecuted under the, uh, uh, the, the law. And then there was a test case, a trial with the constitutionality of the uh, law, the Scopes Monkey Trial, this very famous case. It's a film about this called Inherit the Wind, um, which, which brings about high profile lawyers representing Scopes is uh, the civil libertarian criminal defense lawyer, Charles Darrow. Um, the special prosecutor in the case is former three-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan, a religious uh, fundamentalist uh, conservative, so liberal on, on economic issues, but very conservative on social issues. And the highlight of the trial comes when uh, Darrow calls Bryan as an the prosecutor as an expert witness uh, about the Bible, um, because one of Brian's arguments was that the Bible should be interpreted literally, and therefore the Tennessee law was a rational law, and goes through passages in the Bible, like uh, Job being swallowed by the whale, um, and asks Brian whether these should be interpreted literally or metaphorically. Um, and Brian is, is the, you know, the 
uh, Darrell loses the trial. I mean, this is this is rural Tennessee in the 1920s. But Brian is really made to look like the fool in this race, uh, and the the Scopes Monkey Trial comes to be seen as as a sense that that cultural conservatives really are losing this war of ideas uh, during the uh, decade. <laughs> And then the other big cultural issue during the uh, decade that, that relates to, to legal and constitutional matters is prohibition. Um, you see here on the chart, uh, this, you know, it's just sort of surge of enforcement of the Volstead Act, which is the law that enforces the 18th Amendment for, uh, for prohibition up until 1926 or so, but then kind of a tailing uh, uh, off. Um, arrests, you know, significant numbers of arrests throughout the 1920s. But there's also, you know, let's be blunt, this, this is a, a, a constitutional amendment which is largely unenforced in most northern urban areas. And one of the things that, that uh, prohibition produces is this emergence of urban crime networks that basically, you know, that, that sell alcohol illegally, take a cut of the uh, the profits. And the most famous of these heads of organized crime is Al Capone, uh, who eventually will be arrested and, and uh, charged with income tax uh, evasion, not, not reporting the, the profits from his illegal bootlegging uh, operations. This is the latest trial of the century. You should sense a theme uh, uh, here. Uh, and Capone ultimately will be convicted and, uh, and sent to jail. But this pattern of using the courts to you know, to sort of determine cultural debates, something that I think we're pretty familiar with, dates from this uh, this period in the uh, in the 1920s. This is a very conservative court on economic issues during the 1920s. There's one final kind of constitutional theme uh, during this, this period. 1924, uh, the incumbent is Calvin Coolidge, a very conservative Republican. The Democrats nominate a, a quite listless, uh, fairly conservative candidate named uh, John W. Davis. And the 1924 campaign features really the last viable effort of, of to create a, a kind of third party leftist party in the United States, which is headed by this man, Robert La Follette, Republican Senator from uh, Wisconsin, who we saw last time criticized for his opposition to, uh, to World War I, who runs under the banner of the Progressive Party, the same party that Theodore Roosevelt ran in in 1912, although uh, La Follette's progressivism is it's, it's, it's a different, uh, different approach. And for a while, it seems like he's running second in the polls. The progressives might displace the Democrats, but he comes under strong attack late. And ultimately, he carries only one state, Wisconsin, although he does carry a number of counties. So all of the green counties on this map are our counties carried by La Folla. You can see that he does pretty well in the upper Midwest and in some of these uh, Rocky Mountain states, which were quite progressive in the teens and 20s, although they moved very far to the right uh, sense. But the La Folla campaign really shows the limits in an electoral college system of an effective third party candidate. Here you had you know, a high profile senator running against really the weakest Democratic nominee, you know, maybe in the 20th century. Um, and even then he wasn't able to convince anti-Coolidge voters that they should vote for him because there's this fear of throwing your vote away by voting for a third party candidate in the electoral uh, college. So that's our, um, our, our second um, uh, snippet for this week.